Hallelujah! Christ is risen! Would you be seated? The day of resurrection. Mary had been drawn to the tomb, the place of death. But the tomb was empty, and no one in ancient times ever disputed that the tomb was empty, although there were all sorts of theories about why it was so. And Mary was weeping. They have taken away my Lord. She was looking towards the past. She was looking at blessed hours spent in the company of Jesus and at all the hopes that seemingly had perished on the cross. But then she turned round. That's what it says in the Gospel. She turned in a different direction. And every movement is significant in John's account. John, who by the time that he composed this Gospel, had meditated for many, many years on the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. She turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. The resurrection event obviously did not involve some resuscitated corpse like the body of Jesus' friend Lazarus that emerged after four days in his tomb. The raising of Lazarus is the climax in the Gospel of St. John, the climax of the signs which Jesus performed during his earthly ministry. The resurrection is significantly different. Not the restoration of an old world or the resuscitation of a corpse, but the breaking in of something new. And Jesus asks Mary, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? There are various themes in John's Gospel which are repeated and developed like music. One way of understanding this Gospel is to hear it as a Gospel of harmonies and dissonances. The very first words we hear from Jesus in this Gospel addressed to some men who would become his first disciples. Those first words are, what are you looking for? Now, in the conversation with Mary, we see that the truth we are seeking is not so much ideas in the mind, theories about ultimate reality, but what we discover in a relationship with a person. Who are you looking for? He calls her Mary. God calls us by name, as he called over a hundred people by name when they were confirmed in this cathedral last night. And by naming her, he opens her eyes. And once again, she turns. Her eyes are open, but not fully. Because then she calls him Rabuni, affectionate, a diminutive of rabbi, teacher. It's a word from the old life, and Jesus asks her not to cling to him as he was before the resurrection, because resurrection brings a new reality into being. It is not a resuscitation of the old life. It is an earthquake, a new creation. And this new reality 
explains what is otherwise inexplicable, the transformation of the friends of Jesus Christ. They'd been so full of fear when he was arrested that they had all forsaken him and fled. After the resurrection, those ordinary men and women were transformed into a world transforming community. After the empty tomb and the appearances of the transformed body, they were prepared to defy death rather than deny the truth of what they had witnessed. In our day, we tend to ask questions about the resurrection as if it were simply a past event. Even if someone had taken a photograph of the actual moment, it's part of the flatland thinking that is second nature to us, only to be able to regard the resurrection as something past and separate from us. At best, we translate it into some inoffensive metaphor describing an inner emotional state in which winter gives way to spring. In divine reality, of course, the world of individual bodies and separate events is embedded in a vast continuum, a vast continuum in which body, mind and soul are interpenetrated by the eternal spirit. What God creates is not destroyed, but is recreated and transformed. The message that Mary was to communicate to the other friends of Jesus, the message that she communicates to us, is say to my brethren that I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. The earthquake of the resurrection opened a fissure in earth time through which God's future could stream into the world. And we can be part of this future by water and the Spirit, being immersed in his death in baptism and receiving the gift of the Spirit. In the Spirit which makes the risen Christ present to us, which reveals the truth in a person, the human face of God, we discover that life in all its fullness comes not as we hoard up ourselves and set our hopes of happiness on accumulating more and more stuff, but when in the power of his spirit we give up ourselves to one another and so bring a new world of possibility into being. God so loved the world that he was generous and gave himself to us in the person of his human face, his son, Jesus Christ. Love for God, the love which we are commanded to practice as Christians, is not so much an emotion as self-giving and generosity. And self-giving in the power of the Spirit is transformative. It's been proved experimentally in the lives of the saints, even to those of whom St. Peter said, they did eat and drink just as we shall do in a moment. They did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. The day of resurrection has dawned. It is accomplished. But the resurrection is also happening. The resurrection is full of future hope in a world where we have only just begun how to speak the language of humanity as God intends. Being a Christian is not buying into some package of ideas about God. It is certainly not signing up as a member of the churchy equivalent of the National Trust to preserve the memory of Jesus. It is immersing ourselves in a new creation. The hundred plus people from every continent and background who were baptized and confirmed 
in St Paul's last night have entered a new set of relationships in a transforming community, empowered and energised by the Holy Spirit, who is at work bringing the future that God intends into being. This morning, as I gaze around among this great gathering, we come from many different Galilees. We come from many different cultures and countries, but we have all been called to be lively members of God's transforming community. It's a time of great promise and great peril. Our very complex world is menaced by natural disaster and lethal hatred masquerading under the mask of religion. Alone, we can feel immobilized. What can one person do against such huge threats? But as members of the spirit-filled, transforming community that the church is called to be, there is nothing that is impossible as we work together to enlarge the fissure through which God's future is streaming in. And as we cherish one another, as we make one another our work of art, without oppressing anyone with our demands, as we own up to our own weaknesses and needs and discover that so often they are the great community builders, we begin to participate in the great dynamic of love which is eternally exchanged between the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit. We become seized by invincible hope. This morning, we are not entertaining some idea or some memory. We are participating in a living, dynamic reality. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Thank you.